Hey, you guys, here we are. We see you joining into the room. Uh, we got folks coming in right now. I'm seeing Megan, Christina, John Jeffries, Joey, Jimmy, Jeff Onacamp, Daniel Kavanaugh, Caden, Adam, Andrew. Welcome everybody coming in. We have folks just rushing through the door right now. Uh, don't worry. I can see that you're here, but we can't see you. So if you have kids or pets or you're like in your, you know, pajamas starting the day with us uh, from somewhere across the world, don't worry, we can't see you. You're just seeing uh, me and Leo here, but we know you're in the room. We see you joining. Gail, we see you. Frank, we see you. Uh, James, we see you. We have folks from kind of all over right now. And we want to hear just as we get going, this is an interactive room, uh, click over in the chat window and tell us where you are coming from today. We would love to know, James O'Leary, where in the world are you? Gail, where where are you? Where Where's home? Where are you joining us from today? James is from Milwaukee. What's up, James? We see you there. Uh, and uh, oh, we got Maine. We got Washington, British Columbia, Austin, Texas, by way of Minnesota, Boston, Cleveland. This is amazing. This is amazing what's happening right now of having people from literally all over North America joining today. Um, and I bet we have some international folks coming too. We see Madison. We see, there it is, Ruben from Mexico. Good morning. Way to go, Ruben. We got our first international folks, Ryan Campbell from Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm in Duluth, Minnesota today. Leo, how's the uh, the transit and the weather in New York City proper today? You're, I think you're joining oh, us great. from Brooklyn. It's just a little <laughs> slow, but yeah, all, all is amazing. Hi, guys. So glad to have everybody here. Um, as you are joining, um, hey, William from Wales, glad to have you here. We are going to get going. We are going to dive in. We have a, a, a sort of packed agenda of lots to talk about. And this is one of the topics that I am imagining there are going to be a thousand questions and we're not going to get to every single one of them. But for folks who are already diving in, I'm going to just invite you to do a couple things here. Uh, this is around the coffee table kind of conversation. I, I have my my espresso with me. Uh, Leo is charged up and ready to rock. Uh, and we are going to be sort of asking you to be with us in the conversation and ask a bunch of questions. Like we're going to not, we're going to save time at multiple points, not just at the very end. So if you have a question in the moment, ask it, drop it into the Q and A. Uh, that way we can moderate them a little bit. Um, there's also going to be some good discussion happening in the chat window. So wherever you find yourself, whether you're in each of those, um, we're going to send a bunch of links in the chat window. There's going to be a bunch of emojis and high fives in there, uh, all the good stuff. But be with us. Don't sort of sit back and watch. Uh, join the conversation. And so I invite you to do that right now as those things come up. And before we you know, get into the conversation, I do want to... Uh, to Leo's horn a little bit. Um, I do want to introduce you here, sir. Thank you for spending time with us out of busy New York day and navigating public transit to get here. We were laughing about how that, that is it the second oldest transit system in the world? Yeah, exactly. Under, underground trend. Famous fact about New York subway system. And Leo is joining us from there, from New York City, from Brooklyn and from World Spa today. Uh, Leo is co-founder and design director there at WorldSpot. If you haven't been, make a trip to Brooklyn and enjoy that wellness sanctuary, that destination. And one thing that I've loved about kind of getting to know you and also watching WorldSpot come into existence, Leo, is one that you've you've really led a lot of that design charge with a design team and an architecture team. You worked for years, 20 plus years in those realms of architecture and design. And you have really, you know, World Spa is the name. It is this sort of snapshot of thermic bathing throughout the world. So there's a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-geographical experience that's happening all within your facility. So we're going to hear a lot about more of that. We're going to see a lot more of that. But I want to say at the beginning, you know, thanks for being here. And everybody who's joining, you're with one of the best. Uh, you're with one of the pros. Leo, thank you. Thank you for being with us here today. Great to have you. It's a pleasure. Well, you guys, let's uh let's dive in. Um, we're gonna see uh my we it's interactive. You're gonna get a poll. We're gonna have a digital moment that's gonna happen. You're gonna see a screen pop up. We want to know a little bit about you, who's in the room, 
Um, this is one we ask every one of these webinars. So in a minute, this is going to pop up and it's going to say, in what way are you interested in the business of sound? Um, are you an enthusiast? You just love supporting and you're like, man, I want to hear about World Spa. Uh, maybe you're somebody who's thinking about starting a sound related business. You're in discernment mode. You're in uh, business plan mode. You could be somebody who's running a business or you've ran lots of businesses. Uh, and so click that for a minute. We're going to try to get as many responses as we can. Uh, we want to know a little bit about who's in the room here. Leo, you know, you, you can probably click a couple of these boxes. I do want to hear just from you quickly while everybody's clicking their buttons. Uh, how did you get into this? What's your, what's your sort of first memory of thermic bathing in some kind of way? Was it family? Was it home? Was it a spa somewhere that you were introduced to? Where, how did it all begin? Well, sort of uh, a long time ago, I'm coming from uh, with a Russian background. I was uh, going to different uh, uh, bathhouses uh, back in uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg and Siberia back in 90s or 80s. And it was a very strange place, to be honest, very hard to enjoy unless you are really like into this fetish. But it was like very, very sort of like single sided or like uh, uh not sure if I enjoyed it back then, to be honest. Uh, uh, I've studied across the street from Sanduni, which is probably one of the most popular, like most famous places historically in, in there. And to be honest, I never went there uh, before I started the project. It wasn't my thing. But after, like before this project, I was involved in a few museum projects and I wanted to create something interactive, something that people will enjoy, but not only on the content side, but actually to enjoy with their bodies, with their skin, with something that will make them feel and, uh, think different. And I thought about different kinds of things and, different ideas but then you know i uh, i got a call from a couple of investors and uh, amazing uh, people who then became my partners and it's 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 amazing how they were on the same page with a very different background and that's how we started love it love it and i i love this this theme of there was a a discontent in your heart that like oh there's something good here and it's not it's not the way I want it to be, right? Like you said, hey, it was hard to enjoy that in some of the other maybe yeah. Banya experiences that were a little more closed off and only for the people who knew. Um, and maybe this this project has been one to get it open the doors to get it wider to the world. Um, right. So good. We're already let we're already letting the cat out of the bag of some of the things we want to talk about uh, in the rest <laughs> of the time. So we're we're kicking off right away. Um, Lindsay, let's uh, let's share our results here. I just want to tell everybody who's in the room right now. Uh, so exciting. We got some enthusiasts. We got the majority, 62 percent of the folks who are thinking about starting a sauna related business, spa related business, thermic bathing related business. Excited that you're here, you guys. Thank you for being here. Um, Again, you're with one of the best in Leo, and we hope to make this time super valuable for you. Uh, for you folks who are up and running, uh, doors are open. Again, we hope that we're going to show you some roadblocks that you've maybe started to experience or are going to be experiencing, and hopefully that's helpful to get over them. And we got a few folks in the room who have ran a bunch of businesses along the way. So uh, excited everybody's here. Um, let's let's dive in. I want to, I want to sort of not just tell, but we want to show and tell at the same time. So Leo, talk about World Spa today. We're going to get into your history, your past, how it all came to be and all the roadblocks. But I also want to illustrate just to give people visual and give people what's happening today in Brooklyn, where you are. Um, I'm going to share my screen with some beautiful things, but let's kick off and just tell people what, what is this place that you are really inviting so many folks to all the time. Yeah, sure. So World Spa have been open since uh, uh, December, basically a year and a half, and uh, it became uh, uh, quite a popular place. A lot of uh, uh, the stats, uh, our calculation shows that we are, uh, we're getting close to 200,000 visits, which is normal, I guess it's New York, or it's actually pretty good. Um, we are not exactly on a Times Square, we're in the middle of Brooklyn, it's a heart of Brooklyn, uh, you have to get here, which is about 20 minutes from, let's say, Wall Street on a train, uh, or you can come in, in a commute in the car, we have a parking lot. 
So it's 50,000 of square, uh, square feet of joy. You see this facade to the left. Uh, this is uh, a real concrete that is helping us to avoid any unnecessary uh, uh, sounds of subway or noises from New York, Brooklyn streets uh, going into the place. The idea of this rustic portal that you see in the middle, which actually glows at night, it's about three floors of glowing, a glowing portal. And these portals, uh, you will see a lot uh, in the facility as well. They are all inviting you to get different kind of experiences. Like in this case, to leave behind your stressful life of New Yorker or a visitor of New York uh, and enter the world of pleasures. And after you go into this, uh, uh, you enter this portal, you see it in the middle, um, you going through the check-in process and then it's all starting. So it's, uh, it's probably about minimum, you need four, maybe five hours to explore everything. And uh, uh, we have a guides who will help you in to go through all the experiences. Basically, the idea was to bring the most popular uh, spa cultures uh, from around the world into one place. And we make sure, as a team of investors and builders, that we brought the most pure sort of, in many cases, we actually decided to grab a cabins exactly from the source like Eastern Europe, or Morocco, or like different places, uh, and uh, basically pack it into a container and bring it here and make it work. So in a way, this is a very special uh, place where certain cultures are represented by the craftsmanship coming from there. It's sort of like the Met uh, Metropolitan Museum did for the Moroccan uh, um, uh, court in their place, but with a with a spill of uh, spa uh, culture. Uh, so uh, we've done it here in Brooklyn. So I about love, 16. Yeah, I, I love the phrase 50,000 square feet of joy. Like, I love that you're sort of, you know, again and again, it comes back to uh, pleasure and joy and opulence and, and, you know, beauty. And I think I think it's pretty obvious. We're showing some images here that these spaces are just gorgeous. Um, talk a little bit, you know, about the process of saying, hey, like we care about these spaces. We want them to be, we really want them to be beautiful. Yeah, well, that's the whole, basically the process took us about two years of research. The team uh, of uh, the owners and uh, uh, I was back then in charge of uh, uh, the design teams. So there were a lot of vendors and uh, people who were interested to help because, you know, this is a movement. A lot of people take it from their heart. It's not something, you know, it's not just, you know, I'm I'm going to finish your bathroom. It's not that. It's I'm going to give you a part of my skill, which is something that took me like, let's say, 20, 30 years to get to. And I will share it with you in the version of this cabin or in the version of this, uh, you know, materials that we sourced from, let's say, place that very hard to get to. Or let's say this clay is coming and mixed with, uh, let's say you get a clay from Eastern Europe and mix it, let's say, with the hay from Pennsylvania. And then you look at the combination, apply it to the wall, and then it's becoming 20 inches of clay and hay. And then, you know, it's, it's you know, you have to try it to understand that clay and hay room is something very special. It's the one uh, on top to the right. So we traveled, uh, and uh, the first slide, like the slide back, uh, is represent uh, showing a lot, uh, like one, uh, yeah, that one. So to the upper left, you see the Russian banya, which is a special place. I, I hope a lot of people know the difference between the saunas and the banyas. Banyas have a lot higher uh, level of humidity. In order to keep this level high, which is happening manu manually in most cases, you have to create uh, to finish it with a special log structures, which looks like decorations, but in reality, they are not. They are uh, a special kind of wood. In this case, it's kello. Uh, it's very rare. You have to uh, you have to get it from different parts uh, of uh, there is a certain parts in Finland, certain parts in Russia. It's hard to source them, but if you get them right, they are an amazing tool to get humidity and the aroma of the wood in 
uh, and of the forest in your cabin. And we've done it so far. It works amazing. People love it. You see some panels that are covered with cuts of juniper, uh, some um, uh, African ab abash, and other materials are used here. And the combination of them not only give you the control of humidity and heat, it's also uh, very health beneficial. You see all these weeds and uh, like um, uh, hanging from the ceiling in the aroma room. This is one of my favorite and people enjoy it and come there like maybe five, six times a visit because they want to try different kind of uh, flavors uh, and they open up uh, different every half an hour. So that about this uh, this page, uh, we yeah, can. I, mm -hmm. So if you're if you're wondering, there's a lot to geek out about here on materials. We probably aren't going to unpack every design element in this conversation, but just for everybody listening, you know, thinking about materials matters just like in restaurants. Thinking about ingredients matters, and in sauna and spots, that same sort of thing of how do we get the best most sustainable, most authentic, most specific, best use case materials for all of these kinds of things. And, you know, you've sort of said, Leo, hey, what? let's look throughout the world. Let's bring the best materials, even if it's, you know, European kettle wood that's been dead for hundreds of years, that's hard to find and hard to harvest and hard to make, but is the right use for the material. So well, well done there. Um, well, let's let's move to the next one. We got some great questions coming in. I do want to highlight, hey, if you do have some questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A window. We're going to be getting to them shortly. We're going to dive into a bunch of those. Uh, anything to say here on these next few slides? Uh, I will try to move a little quicker. So we decided to to introduce certain modern technologies like infrared, but uh, again, we've tried to use a very uh, special kind of woods and the bionic chairs usually for example, you see infrared rods that help to warm up uh, in, in integrated in the ceilings and in the uh, in the uh, in the walls. In our case, uh, based on the latest uh, research, uh, uh, it shows that it's sh it's supposed to be actually behind your spine, and uh, it's proven that it gives a lot more benefit when it's a lot closer and it's aligning with your back. So that's why we decided to integrate them in those loungers. The salt room to uh, in front, you see the Himalayan salt with most of the our uh, guests are, know what it is, but to the left and to the right, we use the salt that's coming from panels that are coming from the Chopka, uh, from uh, from Vilichka uh, town in Poland, where the aroma therapy was actually invented in uh, 1847 by this amazing doctor who actually was able to treat back then and help people with now, untreatable back then disease, uh, diseases. So, uh, and we also do have uh, in uh, 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 the um, salt therapy uh, uh, in, uh, unit that is grinding the medical salt and send it into the air. And this room is very popular. The upper right corner uh, is uh, upper left corner is the sauna that we call the uh, the um, uh, event room that where we have events every. A uh, couple of hours with different uh, aromas. Uh, we infuse snowballs, you know, the August thing, uh, and uh, we also do different kind of treat treatment with the uh, plaza treatment with different kind of uh, veniki or the branches uh, that share the power of the leaves. Other materials that are used is very special stones that we put on our. Uh, here is this is the jadeite stone, which is sort of the same family as a uh, jade. So it's a lot of combinations of things that together create this orchestra or choreographed uh, thing, which reacts with your lungs, with your skin, and with the uh, and shares with you the positive energy. And that's how it's supposed to be. Well, right? I I think absolutely, and. I love that uh, one of the comments in the chat right now from Michael is, I'm getting married in NYC next month. I'm definitely be making a visit for some R&R. &R. So a uh, honeymoon visit already from Michael. Uh, Leo, thank you. You're, you're, you're already inviting people to join here. And we have some other okay. folks basically just saying, hey, like, wow, there's all these different sizes. We're going to get into some design things uh, in a little bit on some of these challenges, but um, I, I think Christina has a good question here. You know, thoughts on one large heater 
versus two smaller heaters for a larger commercial size sauna doesn't matter. Change the experience of the bathers. Finding so I think in some ways, right, there's a underneath the hood here. How do we make these big spaces work? How do they efficiently heat? How what happens if one goes down? Those are all things that sort of we think a lot about when we design spaces. Leo, anything that you'd give as just a recommendation or a tip on yeah, sort of proper heating and or proper inner workings of these on your electrical uh, engineering and plumbing side, because that's definitely a part of the project is you're going to be your MEP. Do you have any, any, any thoughts for Christina there on sort of how to get these spaces heated well and heating thoughtfully? Sure. A lot depends what you trying, what atmosphere, what uh, what is the result that you're trying to get? Is it the dry heat? Is it the humid heat? Uh, and uh, back on that, you will decide. The uh, issue that I've heard and uh, the reason why we don't use the heaters next, like, you know, when you put two heaters next to each other, you have to read the manuals and, uh, and reviews on these heaters. A lot of people will share their experience with a certain kinds uh, to avoid the overheating because some of the heaters are actually not designed to be next to each other and their motherboards or their uh, internal um, conduits will melt if they're not uh, placed correctly. That's my that's my right away uh, answer to Christina. That's why if you can use one more powerful instead of two smaller ones, it's fine. But if you use um, like in certain places, I've seen like you need you need to put five or six uh, just read reviews and, um, you know, get some aquathermal consultants to help you to get the right uh, equipment. It's quite important to get it. Yeah, the, absolutely. Uh, so we've seen, we've seen Russian Banya, we've seen Finnish sauna, we've seen a couple different versions. Uh, now we're looking at lots of tile. This screams beautiful hammam kind of experiences to me. Uh, talk about these spaces. Well, here it's actually quite interesting. Morocco is one of my favorite places to visit. I like, I've been there many times and I wanted to bring the authentic uh, hammam. But if you go to Morocco, and that's what sort of like I will share publicly my small secret, which I, uh, the uh, upper left, uh, very colorful uh, um, slide that you see there is actually the opposite that you you will see in Moroccan hammams because usually the authentic hammams they look like uh concrete boxes they are very brutal like they are very different uh, if you'll compare them to the hotels riyadh where you're staying with all this amazing tile so we decided to do our small disney version basically to use the environment the heat and the steam like like it's there uh, but the walls and all the finishes are real mosaics and shapes that are shapes of Riyadh, so which are small, uh, amazing, like those uh, Moroccan authentic uh, uh, hotels. And the reason behind it, and actually I have a lot of people from Morocco visiting it and really saying like, Leo, you know, it's not like there. So like, yeah, I do. And they saying, but we like it. It's, it's really beautiful. And uh, uh, funny enough, I, when the customers are actually specifically waiting for the steam generators to have they have this like half an hour a waiting period where the steam goes down. They're coming there with the phones to take pictures because they cannot take pictures when the steam is on. And so, and the yeah, the uh, one... hammam the hammam is less Instagrammable due to the hundred percent humidity in there most of the time, for sure. For sure. Yeah, you basically. I think the trick, if you want to take a picture, you have to take a blow dryer. Uh, put it uh, your uh, warm up your lenses on your phone if you're not gonna melt them. Then go there and you have like 15 seconds to take a picture. Uh, anyway, so uh, the one to the right is the Turkish uh, with this uh, Turkish, uh, and they both not only have a steam; they have a different kind of aromas that are injected directly. A special kind of uh, uh, flavors that we are getting. Uh, that are meant to represent Moroccan or Turkish culture. And also we have music in all of the rooms. So when you're coming there, we basically control this environment. I call it the 5D control. 3D is the, uh, you know, the three-dimensional view of the space. Uh, four and five is the music and the aroma. Basically you close your eyes. Everything that's left for you is just whatever you control, which is your thoughts, your well-being. 
Everything else is by us for you. So that's why I call it joy. So, and the other, the, the two treatment rooms below, there are places where we do the scrubbing and different kinds of combinations of clays and stuff applied to the skin. They come with, in combination with the hammam visits. This is something very special. It was extremely painful and long uh, process to build them. So when you see the pictures, this is actually all the real mosaics. The gold is real sieges gold uh, mosaics and installation and making sure that everything looks proper and works proper was a uh, special exercise, let's say. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, you're getting to things that I often am wanting people to think about. It's all five senses. So when you're in these kinds of spaces, we're actually inviting people. And this was coming back to your work in museums previously of, you know, it's not just an intellectual exercise. It is a fully embodied and every single one of your five senses and your mental energy while you're in here. And you've really created a number of spaces to do that. Um, so as we sort of round the bend here on some of these last images, um, now I'm seeing some great pools. I'm seeing some relaxing areas, uh, not just putting yourself into the heat or the scrub. Uh, talk, talk about all the, the ways that you're inviting people to water in cold, Leo. Well, uh, it's uh, your skin is one of the largest organs, and a lot of our visitors they forget, or we forget about that fact. And it 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 works with us. It tells us uh, what to do, how much you can stay in the room, what's your limit. So a lot of our visitors asking questions like that. What? How long should I stay? But in a way. Uh, you will know. You will know when to leave. And uh, the combination. But the general thought is, if you spend, let's say, ten minutes in um, in um, in a ba in in Banya, then you will probably have to spend about ten, fifteen, maybe twenty minutes to more time cooling. So you have to go to a cold shower. You have to go to a cold plunge. And cold plunges are insanely popular now. And there are many reasons of all these benefits that are popular. I'm still researching the facts about the six minutes cold plunge that a lot of people like to do all this challenge. I'm I'm not sure if you need six minutes, to be honest. A lot of people saying they do. Okay, cool, whatever. Uh, but I will say like two or three minutes is just enough, especially in combination with banyas. So the Japanese uh, sento that you're awesome, that you see to the upper left, uh, two rounded, uh, they're 100 and 104. And the small uh, boxy one is about 48 degrees. So this is where you do all this. Uh, you're spending a few minutes in hot and then you jump in for a few seconds in cold, then you return to the heat and all these millions of needles start to penetrate your skin. It's something that uh, my wife enjoys. She She's doing that, like she's there at least half an hour of any of her visits and uh, all is very popular with for the crowds. And then, you know, all these big pools, the pools are the place where you cool, you, you chill and um, and then you return if you're ready to return for the bathing. So good. Well, Leo, it looks gorgeous. Thank and you. and you've put in, you know, thousands of hours to make it. So uh, I want to get to some of the questions that are coming in. We have some really interesting questions. And then I want to hear your war stories, because I know it's hard to make something beautiful. It's harder to make it beautiful than it is to make it uh, brutal, like you said, in the sort of old experience that you've been in a couple of times. Um, Let's let's just grab a couple of questions. Julian's asking a good one here. Um, how did how do you think about your audience? So what's the what's the split of that sauna spa enthusiast versus that uh, great New York tourist experience? Right, you got you guys serve both. You serve lots of New Yorkers. Uh, you serve lots of people who are sort of fitting this in. You also have a lot of people coming there from all over the world. Do you have any sort of demographics, any sort of ways that you're sort of measuring, you know, is it more of a tourist experience or more of a, a local experience? It's more and more of the local experience, though, uh, the more and more people who knows about us and plus the more our marketing uh, going into the planes, going to airports. Uh, what we are getting, a lot of people who are, uh, let's say, coming to New York and their check-in time is like later in the day, 
before you know they will spay, sp spend four hours with their uh suitcase on the roads you know like in the avenues uh, they just decide to go to world spa right off the air airplane and enjoy uh, the first hours in new york and then keep getting you know, energy and power and clean up after the plane and getting this energy that they need for their trip. So we, we got tourists like that. So I see a lot more people coming with suitcases uh, uh, on the way in or on the way out from the city. Uh, most of our visitors uh, are, uh, yes, uh, they are local. They are from Brooklyn and from Manhattan, a lot, a lot from Manhattan, about 70% of our visitors, maybe 75% is female. And uh, we enjoy it because, <laughs> uh, you know, they, it's, a, it's a nice crowd and uh, they bring parties. Uh, there are a lot of uh, events that they like to organize about their visit. Uh, everybody coming with a bunch of friends. And it's just we have cabanas for that. We have private uh, rooms uh, for with their own saunas downstairs for uh, small parties where they want to be like some influencers or some celebrities. We have a lot of celebrities coming here um and uh we try to be cool we don't you know show anything when nobody's taking pictures with us so, <laughs> even if we want to uh but uh, it's you know it's hospitality uh, uh and uh so it's all over what what i enjoy specifically and my team is the fact that it's it's just a melting pot you know in many ways it's really representing all the you know kinds amazing uh any kind of uh people from the city or and tourists as well so one of our questions coming in is you know asking about okay we have all those people is that matching exceeding or or missing your sort of estimations early on we have folks at multiple different stages of the process of dreaming right now to planning to building to operating you know you you guys are doing roughly 200,000 people, you know, and is that, is that matching up with what you were hoping for when you were starting? Yeah. The process? Yeah. It's actually exceeding. It's um, mm -hmm. and uh, we're getting more and more, like there are a lot of people, we have crazy amount of returning customers. Yep. It's And that tells us a story that people like it. And, you know, it's just not enough. One visit is not going to tell you the whole story they want. And the more they get to it, the more they, uh feel it some somebody will come and say like oh yeah i want only to start with hamams or i only know the infrared and i feel safe there but then they open up and you know sound culture culture it's a big uh like it's a it's a key to a lot of things people open up that's why in certain countries that's where people are signing contracts uh talking business talking politics talking uh talking or not talking Absolutely. I, I often say it is one of the most malleable spaces in all of architecture and human design. It's the kind of space where you can have silence and solitude. You can have a gregarious bachelorette party. You can do business and politics, and you can be in a space to sort of grieve and process your emotions, right? It's one of those spaces that really can do, it holds the span of human capacity in so many ways and people sometimes in north america they don't think that you know it's just okay it's spa it's relaxed that's all i'm there to do but when you start to be in the kind of cultural movement of it you see wow this is just a human act we're supposed to do this we're supposed to rest we're supposed to rejuvenate we're supposed to bathe um, and that hot and cold is good for us you see all these other experiences of it and i think you've created a lot of different spaces for that to be possible uh, Christina asked a great question. Um, what's the most popular room or space at World Spa? And then Leo, I want to ask a follow up. What's your favorite of all the spaces that you've created? So what's the one that gets most people it's in? A, and then also, what's the one you go to when you're in? It, it, it's hard to say, but interesting enough, like, you know, we have those, we call them events, but really it's entertaining. So we have a team of uh, uh, plots of people with Veniki, with uh, with this, or with uh, hand fans, or with the towels, they're coming to a certain place at a certain hour with a certain uh, aroma and create entertainment. And and most of uh, the visitors they're being invited 
uh, by, you know, the, there is a voice that is saying through the speakers, uh, it's time for another event, or there is a guy with a big bomb coming and uh, inviting. So probably the Grande Bani is probably one of the most popular because when I go next to it, I see like up to 60 people <laughs> sitting there. Uh, and it's kind of, you know, dark. And uh, especially when there are people see a lot of uh, first comers, they, they don't know what to expect. They look a little scared. But then, you know, it's such a joy to see them coming out of there, like coming happy, jumping in cold pool or going to the uh, shower where they pull the bucket. bucket. Uh, we have this special technology that is doing sort of a little more than this bucket thing. Uh, it's a lot more cold water that's coming because you need it and you need more than a bucket. So uh, uh, so it's probably, yeah, that that's the most popular. My favorite, actually will be the aroma like the the one with uh, with the stuff hanging from the ceiling it was the first one that we installed in 2020 there was no electricity on site really basically it was all for construction we're still pouring concrete and this was the first one was delivered from eastern europe and installed and i was looking at it and thinking you know projecting it to another 16 that were on the way and then the hit the COVID hit actually <laughs> so it was like a challenge and i i was going there with no heater with no light just sitting in the dark surrounded by all these aromas of the callow and juniper and uh imagining how like just a like few years after that, there will be like hundreds of people coming in. And when I see it now, uh, popular and uh, uh, nice lit, uh, I, I enjoy this sort of, uh, you know, flashback uh, effect when you connect these two events of so before and after. So uh, we're, we've really fallen into kind of our next area that we want to talk about. And that is, you know, how did World Spa come to be? Right. And you were doing this also in the heart of COVID. So I want to I want to come back to that one sec. I do want to highlight there has been so many good questions coming along. We're going to keep getting to them, keep asking them. They're falling into uh, scale and capacity, maintenance, uh, audience and competition as the movement continues to grow. Um, I do want to highlight to folks, we just sent over uh, uh, a bit of a resource that we want to have you go check out. And that is the uh, Guide to Hydrothermal Spa and Wellness Development Standards, third edition. Uh, it is very geeky. Okay, this is in the weeds. This is policy and detail. And look at it. it he's got it printed on his desk uh, yeah. right there. So uh, there is a free download from that. And big shout out to the Global Wellness Institute for putting this together. Um, I think it's a great resource. It's a great resource for trying to think through some of these things. Um and I would, I would just highlight, go click that, save that link in your browser, come back to it at a later date. It's going to be uh, a good read to either put you to sleep to or get you excited for the process of what you're building. Leo, talk about the process of making this thing real. Because, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, yep, we got 200,000 people showing up. Look at this beautiful mosaic. Um, also, you did this during the, you know, part of this build was happening during the pandemic. Uh, I, I want to hear a little bit more about the origin story of going from doing this in Moscow and St. Petersburg and working in design and museums. How did you really kind of marshal the emotional, personal, financial energy to make this real in the world? Talk a little bit about that process for you. Sure. First of all, it's not only me. There is the whole team of owners. And uh, it started by one of the guys uh, who wanted, to, to, there was one very uh, old uh, bathhouse on the same avenue in Brooklyn many years ago. A lot of Brooklyn people, they know it. it's called Sanduni. It's exactly, exactly like it's called in Moscow. That was the place. I was going there like 20 years ago uh, and probably like, about 10, 15 years ago, it's actually closed. But before that, one of uh, my partners and uh, probably one of the most creative people on the team as well, he wanted to buy it. 
And somehow the deal didn't go through. And I don't remember all the details, but basically, and uh, that place was kind of, fun. I, I honestly will say, filthy. So it wasn't the place to go. But it was like very post-Soviet sort of like representation of uh, uh, what the uh, Bani can be. Uh, so, you know, and then uh, the, we started to build a team together about seven years ago, and I got invited uh, because I run uh, complex uh, projects like that. Museums are complex. You have to deliver very mm, sometimes challenging ideas, and especially presidential libraries. You know, it's not the easiest thing to do. So, and they are very interactive. So uh, I got invited into this team and we started to brainstorm together. At first, the ambition was to build something a lot smaller, like maybe one triple of the size but then you know the appetites grow and we understood that uh, we have to go big and uh, that's that was like about six years ago i think so so, uh, so we started about seven and a half years ago it was just a parking lot there was nothing here there were two broken trucks standing and um interesting fact about this specific lot is you, you know the magnificent hulk the guy the green hulk the the big guy who is turning green in in the uh, universe i i forgot exactly how his name is spelled but you know the guy who is like with the big big uh, muscles the hulk yeah the hulk yeah, yeah. the so marvel, basically, marvel superhero yeah exactly so <laughs> the actor the original actor who was um, his gym was the building next to us so we have a superhero of the Midwood. And even the fire station that is around the corner has this uh, two-story high uh, sculpture of this guy. Like, <laughs> it's there. So uh, so we are basically we're building this uh, spa next to the gym of the superhero. So uh, we wanted to create something special as well with the um, superpowers, in a way. So uh, going from that... Uh, it was about two uh, two years of research. We're traveling Eastern Europe and parts of Asia, uh, Nordic countries, uh, then Turkey, other places, uh, uh, trying to understand what will be what makes sense to bring back, and so uh, and also shopping for the vendors or for people who will be able to build it because you know there. Are, now we have people who are building amazing projects like you uh, and they are coming local and they're sleek, modern and amazing. But in our concept, we wanted to look for, you know, we, we have this thing of authenticity that we wanted to bring and see how people reflect on it. And again, it's a pilot project. There will be more coming. We are uh, quite ambitious and we... Um, we're having a high pressure of real estate, uh, especially from the city where all this re uh, retail is slowly dying and they need, uh, you know, to have an answer to this unanswered question. So that's, but that's uh, later. So uh, going back to the history, after two years of research, we started to bring um, sort of the concept together. And that's where actually the... Um, the story that those guys telling here, which is the Global Wellness Institute, it's quite interesting. Uh, starting from page 29 to page 42, it's a must read for people who are interested. It's going to save them tons of money. And even if they will disagree with certain things, it's okay. Just the knowledge is something. We didn't have that. We were <laughs> going like we were trying to find the right consultants and, you know, that's what you do. You, when you have a question, you find somebody who knows the answer and who have an expertise. Well, back then in uh, 2000, uh, basically back then there was nobody to ask. We started to ask people in the hotel industry who is building spas and designing spas, but that's a very different thing. And I want everybody on this call to understand that if you don't have 20 or like five or three floors of the rooms below you, another 15, 20 or 80 rooms, uh, floors above you, it's a very different business model. You have to understand that most of the consultants will start to create different kind of calculations for you that will include the profit from the rooms that do, you don't have. And that will be a killer for you when the moment when you'll start building. Uh, and uh, so where where is the profit coming from? Because they they for them spa is a luxury. It's it's something that is not making money. It's something that 
it's not supposed to make money because it's just there because it has to be, but it's not what, what it is for you. So be very careful with that. That's a uh, super help. That's a super helpful insight because you're right. You want to work with partners who, you know, share vision and values. But when you look at hospitality, it is based on room nights. They win if they get people sleeping in the beds. And, you know, you had to, in a very real way, create your own gravity there in Brooklyn. You had to make the destination. And I know there's been a number of questions in here that sort of relate to scale. People are asking, hey, why go big? It's more complex. It's more, you know, costly. It's more unique. Uh, it's harder to do. And it sounds like you guys said, yes, but we want to do that. And we felt the need to create our own gravity. We felt the need to like be this kind of place that was a, a destination and not just um, a, a neighborhood experience. Am I understanding that right, Leo? Is that is that sort of the thinking that you guys were saying as you started both running the numbers and talking about what you wanted to do? Yeah, you're right. And another thing is, uh, if you will go very small and uh, at like, I don't know, 10, maybe 7,000, which is probably most of, uh, it's a good start. The issue that you most likely will run into, and we see that in Flatiron, there'll be another project that will be opening next to you or next to you. And uh, the, the, there will be a few of them. And the question is, what makes you so special? And, uh, you know, the smaller the project, the easier, the easier it is to to create another one uh, without your mistakes <laughs> next to it. So. Yep. yep. And so there's, I love that angle. And you've talked a lot about how you're excited that other businesses are opening in New York specifically. And Michael's asking here, you know, hey, what's your thoughts on competition? I've been to Bathhouse, you know, I've done some of that stuff. Um, Flatiron's opening multiple locations, other ships just opening their new location there. Talk a little bit about competition in the movement. Leo, how do you how do you see that? I actually think it's uh, it's great. It keeps us all healthy. It's like, you know, it's like uh, wild uh, nature, you know, you 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 weak, you 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 don't know. so uh every project uh, and in a way I know all uh, owners of this uh and I go to all of these places the moment they open, sometimes even before, because uh, I'm curious what's there. But they are so different. They are they have a very different missions. And in a way, uh, social aspect is very pretty much yes. But the crowds, the um, the rate, uh, it's 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 very different. Like again, other ship is uh, new to uh, New York, and I'm looking forward to see how. And I see a lot of potential there. Guys are very ambitious, uh, very, very, uh, and and what but what they do, which is amazing, is they educate the crowd or their visitors on what to do in sauna. We do as well, but we do in a very different angle. They do, it's all about the stress release. They tell you like how to breathe in the sauna. And I started to see a lot of people, but they go there only for two hours because it's class-based. So you understand, they go there, two hours over, they're out, which is working for a lot of people's schedule. But when you go for wellness, you want to spend, let's say the whole like eight hours or six hours and you want to eat, you want to drink, you want to enjoy. Sometimes you want to celebrate. And that's where... You know, people from other ship, they go to World Spa, I guess, or the same thing with the other brands. Uh, the let's say uh, Bathhouse is very sleek. It's uh, it's very hip and young and amazing place in uh, Flatiron. But some customers likes to be in the bathrobes. Like I'm not sure. Like somebody is perfect. Somebody wants to, you know, uh, and uh, they don't give bathrobes. <laughs> we do. And things like yep. that. It's the small things, but it makes a big difference for a lot of people. Absolutely. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn a corner here for us because I want to hear your war stories with the remainder of our time. We're gonna get to a couple other questions, but we do want to hear what are these big roadblocks. Before we get there, um, I just want to note to somebody and and folks that are kind of following along, we're sending over some additional resources. Um, I am seeing so many questions right now that are specific to kind of operations, maintenance, uh, scale, percentages of people coming back. They're the kinds of questions that I think are super valuable, super insightful. 
we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can. And, 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 um, we have rooms for this. We actually have, uh, the sound of business accelerator. So we have a program for folks to get coaching, to get online learning, to get support other than this room. This room is very wide net. Um, if you want to join us for that, please check out that link sound of business accelerator. Um, we worked with 75 plus entrepreneurs who are launching businesses like this throughout the States. Um, we've, we're working with some folks that have big vision, like, like Leo. And we have folks that are working with small sort of unique pop-up concepts so, and everything in between. And so think about that. Take a look at that. If you're looking for accountability, support, coaching, and expertise, we'd love to support. Now, Leo, hit, let's hit us with the war stories here because yes, it looks pretty. Yes, it, you made it happen in the world, uh, but that was not easy. And there are people that are looking at following the same journey, right? And maybe t walking down similar roads. What are some of those big roadblocks and hurdles and challenges that you experienced and that you think other people probably are going to run into along the way that they should know know enough about before they get into it? Yeah, there were uh, many, but I will start with, uh, well, look around uh, at your partners and uh, make sure that it's not just one person making decisions because it will be hard to build something, especially social uh that will be uh if you'll see that uh your team is stable like the actually the owner's team the team the design team uh not design team but the uh, the you know the future ownership team that's one thing another thing is building a team of vendors be careful who you trust this is something that is so important like there are, again, a lot of people who will be able to will be happy to advise you. But do these people have exactly the knowledge that you need? Or they are, let's say, you need to build a boat and they have uh, they've built a plane and they think that uh, they can help you with building a boat. But your boat is a boat and they, they have a plane behind them. So. Uh, you know what I mean, Justin, because uh, if if you see that your consultants are not answering the questions that you and just, you know, don't don't spend too much time. Uh, yeah. Move on because uh, uh, time is precious. And the uh, and uh, this is important. We we were lucky with the advice. We got uh, quite a team from the very beginning and that that helped us a lot. Uh, there were challenges in finding the correct sourcing the materials and um, making sure that they're all on budget. Some people, uh, technology as well is very important. But now, comparing to whatever we were in 2020, uh, we brought a lot of our technology from Europe because we needed the power for the size of the rooms that were not available in the United States back then. Now, you have... A lot more than we did back then, but it's still like I I like the brands I you, you worked with, uh, gas heaters uh, in terms of uh, if you try to planning to do events and something on schedule in a big room will save you a lot of money on electricity. They're environmentally a lot cleaner, uh, in my understanding, because uh, they're just a lot more efficient. Uh, finding the right ones and installing them sometimes looks de uh, like uh, expensive, but if you'll do the right calculations and uh, uh, project them in a few years uh, ahead, you will see that you're saving tons of money. Uh, uh, if you are in certain areas uh, in the country uh, where you can use uh, solid fuel, which is logs and stuff, this is something authentic that will give you and you have a source to this materials that will save you a lot of money and in you know in new york you cannot do that in public spaces uh period you cannot use logs or any of this uh, which is unfortunate because that's that's quite an experience in certain places maybe upstate they can anyway so uh, uh then going through construction uh always be on top of your uh, schedules and uh, make sure that somebody reports back to you or you uh, <laughs> Uh, you have other people with you going through the schedule, so you you're clear how fast you're moving, and um, and there will be some uh, challenges like uh, let's say COVID for us, 
but convert these challenges to your benefits. Like, you know, in the structured market, like uh, when everything is beautiful and smooth, the prices are insane. But for example, uh, we uh, we had a very good deals uh, directly with some manufacturers in Europe for, for light fixtures, for example, which were not available if we'll be going through vendors. And uh, you can go uh, over the vendors' heads uh, if situations like COVID or <laughs> some other happening because you don't have time to deal with that. So try to di work directly with the manufacturers or people who you trust who will be able not to sell you like upsell something so uh, all of that i think our main challenge probably was still COVID and delays uh, uh, but uh, i think the second challenge if not the first one is to then to hire the right stuff and to be able to calculate their payrolls and everything so that will work for your benefit to to find the right people uh, to get rid of the people that you hired by mistake and understood that they're not working in um, it's 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 it takes time but you have to you have to move and you have to uh, to be strong yeah so i think i i say so often for folks on the scale of these sorts of projects it often will cost more and take longer than you want it to because you're an entrepreneur, you are seeing vision and you're motivated and you want things to be open tomorrow. And the people who do it well, they're just super persistent, right? They manage the project in a way that they keep the thing moving. They keep making progress again and again and again. It's, you know, you saying double down on your timelines and your project managers and your team to make sure those things actually happen. And the bigger the project, the more that is needed, the more accountability there is needed. Um, the more the more insight and overhead is needed. So uh, tremendously helpful. Leo, uh, was there ever a day you didn't think it was going to work? Was there ever a moment where you're like, oh my goodness, what have I got myself into? Just level with me here. Level with everybody in the audience. When you were sitting in there and COVID hit, was there a moment you were like, oh no? Well, mm -hmm. No, I actually thought, well, there was a moment, there were moments of challenges, mostly coming from, let's say, some like Department of Health that are slow and you understand that they're not even, they don't care. They will, the the certain processes will take two, three years. They will complain about lack of staff or anything. And we were trying to do everything up to the codes and we've done significant amount of filing reviewing and uh, that's why when we get visits from inspectors we know we're confident we know we know we can do it we can we uh, i'm coming out to them talk to them or my stuff coming out and they uh we we know it's uh it's uh everything is on uh the best uh available on the market uh and uh, safe but the way it was handled uh in after COVID times when they were uh, very slow, I thought that, you know, basically you have, let's say this 150, 200 people hired, they're all ready to open and Department of Health is just not giving a sign off and things like that. And uh, yep. you can imagine how you feel it. Like it's, you don't feel like it's not going to happen. You just feel that it's really ext extremely painful and unreasonable. And I think that, I think that so often, you know, we are, we are, needing to educate some of these people even in the department of health you know like you said they don't care also some of them have never been in a sauna or a banya or a hammam ever in their life and so yes they have code to follow and it's sort of on us as owners to go above and beyond and this is kind of a maybe just a perspective on the movement that's happening right now is throughout the us and this is maybe to your benefit of working to some extent with a lot of European and, and other areas for providers, we actually need a lot of this information happening here, you know, and, and Christina was saying, Hey, I'm, I'm having a, I'm doing something small, but I'm having a hard time finding a sounded designer. Right. And that's why we're working with a lot of folks. Um, and I think that it's worth doing your due diligence and going above and beyond on safety, quality, and longevity of your space for anybody. So Double di doubling down on that for everyone. Just I, I want to make sure that's that's sort of said and helpful there. Um, 
And there's a lot of questions as we round out our time around business model and details there, size and scale. Um, I'm going to point you back to our last webinar with Annette Scott. We actually went through sort of a whole host of different models that we're seeing. Leo's on the top of that list. Leo's 50,000 square feet of joy, like we said. Um, there is a lot of different versions of that. It wasn't always joyful to get there, but it is. That's what he's serving every day. And so I want you guys to go look at where you fit in those and even sort of get into the weeds on. We talk a lot about staffing, a lot about options there. Uh, how big is your staff right now, Leo? Just as a so quick. It's about 170, but uh, don't, yep. don't forget that we have the big food and beverages uh, component, which is an important part, yep. especially when you stay more than four hours, you're getting hungry. Great, great. So you guys, we are hitting the end of our time. Uh, what an amazing time, Leo, to like kind of dive in deep with you in Brooklyn to see what you've done, to to hear about it. Um, not just uh, like we heard earlier of um, one of our folks in the chat who is going to join you there. Uh, I really invite you go visit World Spa in Brooklyn. Uh, follow them on all the things. And uh, I want to hit. Uh, we we do these webinars every single month. Our next one's on October. Uh, August 14th. We're actually going to dive. It's going to be an internal one. It's gaining clarity as an entrepreneur. We're going to be with Steve Crosby from Ireland. You're going to hear of what he's launched over the last years there and how he's persisted and sort of made it real uh, serving the country of Ireland. So if you're like, man, I'm not so sure about this, or I'm trying to figure out, is this the project I want to work on? That conversation is going to be really helpful for you. Uh, in the fall, we're going to be with some architects from Studio Pusto out of Finland. Uh, we're going to meet with some locals. So we, we have a bunch more coming. So sign up, enjoy. The recording is going to come out soon for this. You'll see that in your inboxes if you couldn't make it. Um, Leo, thank you for being here. Any final final parting thoughts for our team and our folks here as you're, you're seeing any uh, invitations you want to say? Well, it's uh, it was amazing to uh, thank you for invitation, and it was amazing to chat. I'm I'm just so excited about seeing so many people interested. Uh, we had so many attendances, and uh, I I see a lot of questions unanswered. So if you Justin will be getting questions to me, please refer. Uh, I would be happy to get in touch with uh, people who needs my help. I'm I'm here. So it was amazing to see all of that and the excitement uh, is there and let's make uh, all our uh, bathhouses work. Absolutely. Well said, Leo. Well said. Uh, kudos. Thank you so much. And everybody who joined today, thank you for being here, for giving us a little bit of your day. And we look forward to seeing you on another one or the next one. Uh, have a great week and uh, thank you guys so much. We'll see you soon.